So this uh, first lecture, basically about um, as an interferometry. Uh, I'm not sure of all your backgrounds. I would encourage you to engage in active question and answer. <laughs> so uh, I have, uh, being an experimentalist mainly, uh, what I do in kind of summer, this kind of school format, is uh, you know, I, I want to tell you about the, the latest results and some of the background for those, but also uh, work in a little bit more experimental detail than I ordinarily would. That works if there are a bunch of experimentalists in the audience. If there are a lot of theorists, it doesn't work. So I'd like, this is, this is going to sound cracks, but you hold up your hand if you're an experimentalist. No, good. Then uh, I'm going to use the, the logic of deduction to infer that everybody else is theorist. <laughs> um, good, so uh, this is the beginning of the field of interferometry, in my opinion, back uh, uh, in the early 90s, I uh, from when I did this Young's double slip term with atoms. And uh, just to, I, I kind of like to show the slide at the beginning of my talks because it shows, you know, I think kind of how far the field has come in the past. Uh, 25 years. So, mean with helium atoms, then it's stable, goes to a slit, so it's narrow enough, atom wave function diffracts, uh, coherently uh, eliminates two more slits, those two slits give rise to some of the propagating light fronts. Uh, according to the rules of quantum mechanics, atom before you square, you get interference fringes uh, in this region here. Those are detected by scanning uh, an atom counting detector, which in this case was an uh, electron multiplier the helium atoms crashed into a main line and, and got a flip. And uh, by scanning this one up and down, you were able to uh, count uh, the number of atoms uh, and also observe uh, the interference fringe structure. And uh, that's what you see here. Uh, so this is scanning the position of that detector. And this is the number of counts, uh, notices, counts per five minute interval measured in hundreds, and you see these uh, beautiful wiggles. And if you compute the periodicity of those wiggles uh, using the Broglie relation, uh, you, you uh, understand those as uh, manifestations of quantum interference. OK, so it seems trivial. It, you know, where we are now, closed kinds of fermi gases, interference obviously happens with atoms. Back in the, back in the day, uh, this, this was pioneering because it was not thought that you could, uh, it was going to be easy to build an apparatus where you could control the interfering paths, where the interfering paths here, well, is, this is path A and this is path B. You could control them uh, uh, precisely enough so that the phase would be stable uh, between the two propagating de Broglie wave fronts so that you would see a stable set of interference ranges. But the thought was they'd be shaking up and down, they'd wash out. And in fact, uh, earlier, uh, there have been a number of notable analyses uh, in the 50s and 60s and 70s. I mean, we've kind of understood that massive particles should interfere uh, since uh, uh, early 20th century. And so people were thinking about this type of stuff. Uh, Schwinger had a paper where he wanted to, he analyzed Stern Gerlach interferometer for uh, uh, massive particles and concluded that there's just no way you could ever. Uh, his conclusion was there's no way you can control the relative path to stability in order to see stable interference ranges. They could just wash out and would look like essentially uh, classical trajectories uh, were taken by the atoms. Okay, so the challenge was to figure out how to build stable apparatus and uh, Mlinic uh, met that challenge with microfabrication and, and presumably controlling the positions of those slits uh, precisely. So now, uh, this is fast forward to data coming out of my group uh, two years ago now. And uh, what, uh, oh, and by the way, let's just put some uh, dimensions on this. So this, this wave packet separation here is measured in distances of, uh, of less than mi microns. Uh, and the, the, this is a thermal beam, the time of flight of that apparatus, short. Uh, here are two ensembles of rubidium atoms, uh, you, uh, rubidium 87. Uh, each time you see one of these peaks, that's where you have a lot of atoms. That's where I would say the, the wave function has high density. And uh, this, is a, this is a picture of resonance fluorescence that's stitched together from a bunch of pictures. And uh, these peaks are uh, separated by 54 centimeters. And what I want to claim is, and I'll, I'll uh, present data over the next uh, 15 minutes or so, 
is that uh, these peaks can be understood as an ensemble of atoms, each atom, in a coherent superposition of this location and that location. And uh, so, so kind of a, an amazing superposition state. And the way we're going to demonstrate that is to uh, build an interferometer <coughs> such that those peaks uh, are brought together, that made to overlap, and then uh, we'll, we'll see interference. Okay, and so then uh, there's the experimental challenge to just saying, like, how do I build an apparatus to make that happen? And then there are the theoretical challenges of uh, you know, what significance do we attach to the fact that such an experiment can succeed? And so I'll, I'll talk about both those uh, issues. So uh, first let me show you some experimental details. Then we'll lower into the data, and then we'll talk about uh, theoretical uh, uh, background. So, uh, challenges, you have 54 centimeter wave packet separation. 50 centimeters is like that from there to there. And if you think about what's doing the interfering, it's uh, an atom, a rubidium atom, which is actually kind of a complicated object, right? It's got uh, neutrons, protons, electrons, a lot of them, all tightly bound at, at fairly high energy scales measured in electron volts. Uh, and uh, this atom now is going to somehow, and it's like, uh, how big is an atom? It's like less than an action across, so 10 to minus to, uh, 10 to minus 10 meters or so. That, that small object is going to somehow separate by 54 centimeters. Of course, we're going to use a quantum description, so I have to talk about this wave packs and all the rest. But thinking classically, it's, it's out there 54 centimeters, one small object, then another small object, and then they're going to come back together and uh, the, the miracle of quantum mechanics, which we, I think, should all be surprised by, that we are going to see uh, uh, interference fringes, which you sort of can <coughs> understand, and, and this is, a, I'd love to have a, a more uh, a rigorous discussion about this. Uh, you can sort of kind of only understand that by thinking that the atom is in, quote, two places at once, right? And, and uh, so I just say, I say that because, you know, like, we, we all have to wrestle with quantum mechanics and superposition. We have to think about how we want to interpret that. And there's plenty of other ways of, of thinking about this in terms of what information we've gained and, and so forth. But uh, nonetheless, it's trajectory, separate, come back, interfere in We'll say, what does that tell us about the world? OK, so uh, well, in order to make, if you were thinking classically, <coughs> you say um, the atom is the size of a golf ball. What is 54 centimeters for you know, separation if, if the atom is the size of a golf ball? It's like sending the golf ball to the moon and back and then expect it to see some sort of interference. So it's not surprising that you need to have tight control over uh, some of your experimental parameters. And so uh, let me just uh, take you through some of the experimental details. Uh, this is a tower in the basement of the physics building. What we do at the bottom of the tower is we make a closed condensate. Uh, it's actually not really condensed there. Uh, we, we, we like to work with somewhat warmer samples just above condensation. but. Uh, they've got to be pretty cold, so uh, we evaporate the pool, I should say, uh, the, the atoms, and, and this is what the kit looks like for that. Uh, and then we uh, mani further manipulate their momentum distribution so that the, uh, the, 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 the free space expansion of the ensemble is um, measured in temperatures below 100 picocalvin. I use the word temperature loosely. This is not a thermodynamic equilibrium. Temperature in the way of uh, talking about, you know, laser cooled ensembles is a, is, a, is a gauge for the velocity spread of the, the wave packet. And so you've got something that's 100 picocalvins, the, the RMS velocity spread of that wave packet is amazingly slow. It's like measured in units of hundreds of microns per second. Which means that if I can take this ensemble and, and launch it on a vertical trajectory and have it fall back down, or the wave packet uh, and of, of a single atom, it spreads by a fairly negligible distance. It takes about three seconds for the wave packet of, of each atom in the ensemble to fly up the tower and come back down. And so by the time it's back down in the detection region, uh, it's, it's as it, it, when you look in the camera, it's, it's, it's barely spread out. This is not the usual situation for atoms, right? I mean, you, you let them go and they usually fly away to the walls of your chamber or especially room temperature where their particles are moving at kilometers per second. It takes a blink of an eye for an atom to go from one wall to the other. Not so here. You can think of the atoms as if they're just a fistful of grains of sand, if you will. We're, we're, we're launching them along this vertical uh, trajectory. We accomplished the launch, and I'll give you more details on this in a, in a moment, with uh, 
uh, laser light and then load it into an optical lattice, and uh, that optical lattice is made to move with respect to the uh, laboratory frame at a speed of about, I think it's 13 meters per second. Um, the atoms are pulled up and then we let go of them, and this, this now ultra cold uh, ball of atoms flies up the tube. We, if nothing else happened, we turn around and fly back down the tube. And we can take pictures of it in this detection window. We also can take pictures of this one up here. We can look at. Uh, so far, no interferometry. I'm just describing the atom source. Uh, what about the interferometry? Well, uh, we use light pulse interferometry where a beam of light comes along the vertical axis of this tube and uh, with controlled momentum recoil uh, kicks around the atomic wave patterns. And I'll, I'll give you some uh, more discussion of this in a few minutes. Uh, but we use sti uh, simulated Bragg transitions in order to precisely affect momentum recoil uh, between uh, uh, the, the interfering wave pattern states. Uh, now going back to the analogy of golf ball and moon, uh, you kind of, you're going to build one of these interferometer, interferometers. I don't care what method you use. Uh, it's extremely important to have very regular momentum recoil. You, you, you need to have exceptional control over the momentum of the uh, atomic wave packets. Why? Well, if you don't, then uh, those wave packets aren't going to come back together and face. In fact, they may not even overlap at all. And uh, if, if that's the case, you're, you're never going to see uh, interference. Uh, this is why uh, the, the kind of momentum recoil from pulses of light trip works extremely well for this class of interferometers because uh, the, the laser wavelength can be defined to incredible precision, especially with optical frequency combs uh, and the current laser metrology methods. I mean, you can talk 15 to 20 digits worth of definition on that if you really needed to. We don't need quite that much of spectral control. Uh, our lasers are stable to the kind of kilohertz, 10 kilohertz level. Compared to the overall uh, uh, um, frequency of an optical photon, that translates into exceptionally regular momentum transfer uh, to the atomic wave packets, and that's, that's absolutely crucial. Now, if you take that step, uh, that thought a, a step further, you say, well, hmm, okay, so you've got the whole situation where you're transferring momentum with uh, the, the, um, the, the pulses of light that are going to ultimately lead to the separation and recombination of the light packets. So what about other forces? I mean, anything in there that gives a little kick of momentum to the weight packet is going gonna, is gonna to turn out to be a problem. And so you've got to worry about, for example, magnetic field gradients. And so uh, triple layer magnetic shield here uh, is there to uh, basically knock out any spurious forces due to gradients in the magnetic field, which might be different. Once you open up that separation to 54 centimeters, uh, it challenges multiply because now, you know, it's, 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 is the magnetic field different in this region of space than it is at this region of space in that apparatus? Sure as heck is. It's different by, we can measure it, milligauss. And then you say, well, what's the gradient in the magnetic field? That would be proportional to the gradient in, 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 in energy, which would be the force that might act differentially in a wave packet up there and down there. So uh, got to control the magnetic field. This triple layer shield does a pretty good job of doing that. We don't think we're limited by uh, magnetic field gradients, for example. Uh, we work with the magnetic field insensitive hyperfine levels of atomic rubidium, the M equals zero states, uh, just so that we don't have to worry about uh, a lot of sensitivity to magnetic field. Uh, another bad actor for us, and this is, this is uh, without this component, nothing works. Uh, we need to accommodate the fact that uh, the Earth is rotating over the time of flight of the atom in the interferometer. You launch it up, three seconds later, everything comes back down. If you do your job right, the wave packets separate by a half a meter, come back and overlap. Uh, they're not going to overlap if you don't account for the fact that the, the Earth is swung through a pretty substantial angle. Uh, yes, Earth rotation rate is 7 tenths minus 5 radians per second. So over a few seconds, it's about 10 to the minus 4 radians. That's a big angle. And if you, if, and what happens is this, there, there, there's rotating, the atoms are in original flight while the Earth is rotating. If, and, but the, the, the laser beams that are doing the atom optics are, are rotating with the Earth. So it's kind of going like this. And if, if you don't accommodate that rotation, the momentum recoil is not going to steer the golf balls back till they overlap again. They're going to miss each other. And so we have this, uh, uh, this mirror at the bottom of the apparatus, way down at the bottom of the pit. 
that basically uh, keeps the measurement axis of the, the, the brag beams aligned to nursery. And so as, as the atoms are flying up, that mirror is, is tilting uh, and is changing the direction of the propagation axis of the uh, laser beams that drive the uh, brag transitions. And uh, I'll, I'll explain a little bit more detail about this so-called rotation compensation system. Without that, nothing works. All right, they say, uh, you know, when you have, we want to say something, say it in color. And here, we all are fans of SolidWorks in the experimental world or your favorite CAD programs and render it. Uh, one of my grad students, Alex Soderbaker, uh, did a Lego rendering of the apparatus just for the scale. So I think that was Susanna. I think that was uh, Philly Boyer was visiting that time. This is the apparatus. You can do this in Lego for your apparatus, too. <laughs> Let's talk about some details. Uh, so this is a rotation compensation system. Uh, Again, uh, here's an experimental detail that I rarely put in uh, ordinary talk. So uh, this is kind of for the experimentalists. Uh, what do you got to do if you want to precisely accommodate the rotation of the Earth? Well, you have uh, this retroreflection mirror. Uh, the uh, Raman laser beam, uh, the Bragg ray laser beams are coming down along a vertical axis here, uh, like so, and then retroreflecting. And uh, they're supposed to, you know, it's coming up and down straight, not as drawn. And uh, so that mirror turns out to have to be pretty high optical quality in order for the atom optics to work out. So that's why you see this kind of big chunk of glass. It's polished to uh, <coughs> those surface roughness. Uh, that sits in a cradle, which is then mounted to uh, piezoelectric transducers, which have encoders on them that measure the, uh, the extension of the piezos so that you can read out the overall angle orientation of that mirror uh, with noise shown in this uh, spectral plot. So this is uh, uh, looking at the outputs of the encoders of that mirror. Uh, this is a, the frequency uh, after a Fourier transform of what those encoders are putting out. And this is the noise power spectral density uh, of the, the angle noise. And uh, the angle noise here is measured in units of nanoradians per root hertz. All right. so, if you say, you know, kind of the one hertz bandwidth of the measurement, the RMS motion of that mirror is sub uh, And I already mentioned the kind of the angle that the Earth is swinging through is on the order of uh, hundreds of microns. So we, we have, you need to have kind of exceptional control over um, that angle articulation. And it's, it's going to turn out that the fact that we have this, uh, this, this piece of apparatus that has such low noise ability to control angle uh, we can use this basically as a, as a earth rotation rate uh, monitor if, if we so desire. Uh, yeah, this whole thing is anchored firmly to the floor of the building. So the floor is down in the bottom of the pit. The floor is shaking at 10 to the minus 8 G, and uh, the, the mirror is rigidly attached to that, and then we can articulate this action. Uh, magnetic shielding was a pain in the neck. It turns out to be hard to build a 10 meter long uh, magnetic shield, uh, although there has been some, I'm, I'm told, some recent uh, innovation from the Hanover Group. Uh, uh, at, at the time, uh, we contracted with uh, Hammy Nill. Some of you experimentalists may know them as one of the kind of leaders in magnetic field shielding. And they gave us a design that didn't work, and we had to redesign it. And uh, ultimately, we built uh, welded 10 meter long tubes. Uh, eight, uh, well, that's how long it worked. We had to anneal them in a, in a furnace in Pennsylvania, and then we installed them in train. And this is a measurement of the axial magnetic field over the full length of the shield. You can see that. Uh, this is probably in part limited by uh, the readout carriage of the magnetometer and, and so forth. But magnetic field control is, uh, is, is uh, in pretty good shape. And it's uh, three concentric rings of new metal. And the details are on that level. Uh, launching the atoms. This is cool. So uh, you load atoms into lattice. You make the lattice run with respect to the lab frame. And you know you kind of think of it classically as uh, just a, you know the atoms are in this washboard potential. The washboard potential is moving because you have a frequency chirp between the up and down beams. And uh, that pulls the atoms up. And you, by controlling precisely the frequency difference between the two beams, you should be able to launch them at any speed you want. Well, not so, because momentum recoil happens in and it's, the, uh, those beams of light are comprised of a bunch of photons, and the photons can only exchange momentum with the atom in uh, photon recoil increments, uh, HK over M, 
And because it's counter-propagating beams, it's two, two photon increments, so two HK over N. And so when you launch the atoms with this plan, the atoms can only acquire a discrete set of uh, momentum given by the photon recoil velocity. And so when you say I want to launch them at 30, 13 meters a second, you mean 13 meters a second, uh, but then in, in, in one of these, uh, these, these uh, graph piece, that is an integer number of uh, photon recoils with respect to zero where they start. Uh, the atoms are cooled to temperatures way below a photon recoil, as I'll explain in a minute. So it's, you really uh, directly resolve the, this kind of quantization of momentum transfer. Uh, what happens if the lattice, uh, you, you dial in a frequency for the lattice where it's some intermediate uh, number of photon recoils? Well, what quantum mechanics does for you is give you a probability for each atom of either being in one place or, 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 or the other momentum peak. And when you do the experiment over the ensemble lattice, you see these, these kind of two peaks. Uh, and so uh, basically, we pay a lot of the, we, we pay attention to um, these, these lattice launch parameters. We want to have very clean momentum distributions for the launch so we can get to pick and choose our, our, our launch lines. How do you make the launch efficient? Experimental detail here. Sorry uh, for theorists, but uh, you, you, uh, it's kind of well known in the lore of laser cooling, which uh, the lore of laser cooling now goes back uh, 30 years, so a lot of times you won't use the curriculum anymore. But um, if you can say, well, what's, what's the bad actor in one of these, any of these uh, situations where you use laser light to coherently or uh, without dissipation, I should say, manipulate the velocity of the Part of it. Well, it's spontaneous emission. It's really scattering, or as, uh, uh, you know, multi-photon inelastic scattering, and that leads to co heating because, uh, uh, like, a spontaneous emission event is in a random direction to, to zero order, and so um, it will. Uh, you want it to send the atom with recoil in this direction, but it spontaneously emits, and also the recoils off in that direction, and you get a lot of these recoil events, and pretty soon that ultra-pristine, cold bunch of atoms you had is now higher than that, and it's not going to work for your interferometer. So uh, it's well known in the, the, uh, the uh, theory of optimal dipole force lattice that the amount of heating you get, you just do the calculation, is independent of the detuning of the lattice from uh, the transition. If you're red detuned, uh, or if you're blue detuned and you put the atoms into that, that standing wave and you calculate the heating rate, Gordon and Ashton style, this is one of the, the key papers back in the 80s, uh, you get the same heating rate. And so you wouldn't expect to see any experimental difference uh, in, in a blue detuned versus a red detuned lattice launch. In a blue detuned launch, the atoms kind of are, are trapped in the dark regions, the, uh, the nodes of the lattice. In the red detuned launch, the atoms are trapped in the anti nodes of, of the lattice. The heating should be the same. And so yeah, you wouldn't expect to see any, any difference, but we, we see a dramatic difference here. Uh, so uh, what I'm plotting here is the, uh, the intensity of the beams used to launch the atoms, and then the number of counts detected at the end of the, uh, uh, the, the three, uh, uh, three second flight. And boy, if I had to choose between 46 gigahertz blue versus 46 gigahertz red, I would of course choose the 46 gigahertz blue. And the, the, the momentum distribution seems to be un, unmolested uh, compared to the red where that smearing out is due to a, a lot of heat. So my question is, what the heck's going on here? I can assure you that that theory, Gordon Ashton weren't wrong. The, the theorists who calculated the heating rate in the lattice were absolutely correct. The heating rate is, is the same for both of those uh, situations. So that's, that's despite the fact that in a red detuned lattice you're trapped at high intensity where there are lots of photons around, mm -hmm. the heating rate should be the same. The, the heating rates are the same. And that's, that's, uh, that doesn't seem like it's right, does it? Yeah, but that, that is in fact true. When you do the calculation, where it, seems, it seems like it should be much worse because the atoms are sitting in the, in the, in the, uh, in the red part that there's, it should, they, should, they should be hot. But in fact, when you calculate the expectation values of uh, energy transferred, they're saying. Think about evaporative cooling. When you evaporate uh, an ensemble, you take uh, out one very hot atom, and the rest of the atoms left behind, um, their, their kinetic energy has been used. What happens in blue D2 lattices is, yeah, you have heating, but that heating comes in very large steps. 
the, the, the amount of energy, so you, you have a spontaneously uh, emitted photon, what happens is a spontaneous emission couples to the optical dipole force, which when the atoms are sitting in the antinodes, uh, in the nodes, is extremely strong. There's a huge gradient of the electric field. You get a dramatic momentum step for that atom that happened to get that spontaneous emission event. Not many of them do because they're mostly in the dark, but if, if you did get that spontaneous emission event, man, you got a lot of energy. And what happens to that in our experiment? Well, the atom that gets all that energy is gone. I mean, it's multi-photon recoils away. It's out of our detection window. So when I show this single sharp peak, what I'm not showing you is a few atoms that carried out a lot of energy so that the overall heating rate was the same as the red region lattice. The red region lattice, the mechanism is different. It's a lot of photons, uh, but the, the, the amount of the energy increment per scattering event is much lower. And so uh, the, uh, the, uh, every atom kind of heats up, and that leads to this, this blob-like uh, dependence. So uh, this is one of those things that we sort of didn't anticipate when we started the experiment. We said, OK, red or blue is the same. It's convenient for us to tune red. We tuned red. Nothing was working. We said, what the heck, let's tune blue. It worked great. And then we had to scratch our heads. So uh, yeah, there's some, some really nice theoretical work on this. And, and this is, I think, the best paper, past 10 uh, 2010. Alice's thesis uh, is also a pretty good reading on that. One more some experimental detail. I'll, I'll, I'll go. I'll pick up the pace uh, after this. Uh, heck, uh, AC starships are a real bad actor for the atom optics. Anytime you flash on that beam of light, you are flashing on an interaction with the atom that can affect its, its quantum phase coherence. And so, uh, if I have a fluctuation in the intensity of the light, that's a fluctuation in phase uh, over these long intervals. Uh, those wave packs come back together. They may not interfere if you didn't do your uh, arithmetic right. Worse than that, uh, gradients in the AC construct shift correspond to energy gradients uh, for the atom, which correspond to spurious forces, which we had that discussion about forces. If those forces aren't extremely regular, no chance of seeing uh, interference. So you can't have gradients in those AC star shift forces either. And so it turns out you have to pay a lot of attention to AC star shift. And one thing that you, you absolutely need to do is to uh, compensate the light shift for every level involved in the interference. And so uh, we drive our Bragg transitions with uh, uh, tens of gigahertz of detuning. And in order to compensate for the star shift, we have a, a red detune set of side bands that drive the Bragg transition right over here. And, sorry, blue detune. And then we have uh, a corresponding pair of red detuned side bands. The red detuned have one, you can say a plus uh, star shift phase. The blue detuned have a minus star shift phase or energy. Red and blue simultaneously correspond to essentially no net energy on balance. And so uh, that gives you the good situation when you buy a unity to star shift. If you don't do this for that 54 centimeter result, if you do not balance uh, the, 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 the overall AC star shift, then you see very you see poor contrast. And we studied that by just deciding whether we're going to balance the beams or not. And this is the basically the ratio of the intensity of this pair of side bands to that pair of side bands. And uh, you know, when, when they're when they're balanced, you have excellent contrast, and when they're imbalanced, this is with the 50% imbalance, you've already down to 20% contrast. There's a question. If I may go back to the launch, um, then you mentioned if you launch from a blue detuned lattice, if this is like a Gaussian beam, then there's also a radial force outwards. Yeah. Let me go back to the. Uh... Okay. So when you launch with a blue detuned lattice, you you get anti-trapping in the radial mode. Is that right? Yeah. You see, when you when you manage the radial mode, you you basically have a residual set, you know, curvature there that that can can serve to shoot the atoms out to the side, or and if if you if you want launching with small diameter beams. You see that in space. Uh, and so our, our plan is to make sure the beams are big. So it's just a big beam. It's a big that's, beam. That's the yeah. Beam. And, and you can calculate you know, what, how big the beam has to be in order to make sure it's not wrong. And uh, but it, once you start thinking this way, then it, you really uh, you can do more. I mean, you, if, you, if you want to have a little, a little focus, I'll explain this in a, in a couple of slides. Uh, say you want to, during the launch or during your atom optics, you want to control the transverse momentum. You actually have a degree of freedom there to, we call it, lens the, the wave packets. To, you kind of 
uh, just like with optical beams, if I want to propagate a, an optical beam across the room uh, without diffraction, well, you can just like, put a lens in the middle of the room. Uh, okay, so, uh, right, sideband ratio key. If, if, if I don't have a pair of sidebands on the other side to compensate the starch, I we essentially see no contrast with these, with these large weight packets. So the shorter wave packet interferometers, we've been doing them from separation of interferometers, doing it for years. The ones that are commercially viable and all the rest, don't need this trick. It's only when you're saying, let's talk about 54 centimeters. It's a, it's, a real, it's a real problem if you don't do it because the shape of the light field, the light field at this position in space is not the shape at this position in space. There's different high intensity uh, noise on the spatial wave fronts that needs to be accommodated. Okay, uh, another trick we use in there. Uh, we need to really, we do need to control the transverse spreading of the wave packets. So uh, after we launch them, we do a lensing sequence where we come in with a pulse of light uh, that's red detuned uh, and uh, exert a little transverse momentum kick uh, to the, the atoms so that uh, you do something analogous to what you do with uh, laser beam propagation. If I start from a point source uh, of laser light and I want to make all the rays go in one direction within the limits of diffraction, uh, I would put a lens somewhere in the beam after the beam is expanded. Of course, there still is a little bit of diffraction here, but that diffraction is much lower when the beam is big. You can do the same thing with atom weight packets, and this is a, kind of a, a crucial uh, experimental trick for us. So, uh, start with a, 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 what's essentially a point source. So the, this cloud is about 100 microns in diameter at, at the start, and by the time we've, we've finished our velocity manipulations, it's more like millimeter scale. And right before we send the atoms into the tube for the interferometry, uh, we have one more pulse of light, which uh, basically uh, collimates uh, the wave packets. And uh, we do this with a far detuned, one terahertz detuned, high power beam. Uh, and, and then the, the, if you really want low residual momentum or velocity spread, you can have effective temperatures that are as low as 50 feet. Uh, again, it really helps for Okay, uh, we're finally up to the interferometry. <laughs> so, uh, how do we how do we affect the, uh, the, the interferometry? Well, that's with uh, a train of laser pulses. Each pulse gives two photon recoils worth of momentum, or for rubidium, about a centimeter per second. Uh, I have a couple seconds to work with to separate them, so. Stands to reason that if I can put a lot of pulses into a sequence and each pulse can be coherent uh, uh, with the last in terms of momentum recoil, I can um, stack up the momentum recoil uh, from what would be one centimeter a second for just one drag transition to 50 centimeters a second uh, or, or, or higher by a whole train of pulses. Uh, each pulse fine-tuned to do a Bragg transition to a particular velocity class and take it to another velocity class, which is two photon recoil momentum away. Uh, and so our strategy here is a kind of a CAD representation of the tower. We started off with all this, all those details I just told you about. Now their atoms are flying up and down the tube. Uh, let's talk about how we're going to split them up and uh, redirect them and recombine. Sequence of pulses. First pulse here is a B splitter pulse, a pi over two pulse, which is tuned to take an atom in a, a, a zero momentum class and put it in a, a coherent superposition of momentum zero and momentum two photon repos. Do you want an analogy of that process? Think about taking a beam of light and shining on a grating, all right, and looking at fractions. So you get. Uh, or, or, or I should say right, diffraction. You, if the beam of light comes in, if you've looked at a grating with, with a laser beam, you get two spots coming out. And if you think about what's happening uh, with a, uh, uh, on a per photon basis, a photon is coming in, and then it's coming off in these two diffracted spots. Uh, the photon is kind of in this arm, till here superposition with this arm. And then you put a lot of photons in, and that gives you, uh, you know, what you see when you uh, look at uh, a diffraction grating. Well, what we're doing is a, a, an analogous atomic physics process where the, uh, the gradient is made from the AC starships due to a beam of light, and in comes an atomic wave packet that diffracts off this. Uh, a single atom can diffract into two momentum states, two diffraction angles, and that's what this first pi over two pulse does. Subsequently, 
we change the operating parameters for the, the bright gradient so that that diffraction efficiency is 100%. You can do this with light too, with laser grading. Or, you know, you, if you design your grading appropriately, you can get all the light diffracted into the other beam. Same thing can happen for atoms, and uh, we do that by choosing the intensity and the duration of the, the pulse so that we control, we take a certain uh, momentum class and add momentum to it. And so we start off, say, at uh, momentum zero, get the first beam splitter, and then this guy here, which is going at two photon repulse of momentum, we now train together a bunch of pulses so that we just hand that two to four moment repulse momentum, four to six, six to eight, and after a bunch of pulses, we got 50 centimeters a second worth of momentum recoil, which after a second time of flight as the atoms are shooting the, the tube corresponds to a half meter separation. Then, uh, then we bring them back together with another set of pulses so that they overlap and they fall back down into the detection region. Uh, and then we take the pictures of the atoms. We take the pictures by flashing on light, resonance, fluorescence, and moving more images on the CCTV. This is the region where the atoms are separated by 54 centimeters. Uh, the pictures I took kind of were where we had a, ca a camera up here and we were stitching together a, a, a variety of pictures, uh, various time of flights and so forth to be able to show that 54 centimeters. Now, we don't look at the atoms. We don't take that picture. We do hopefully don't do anything to tell us to quote, collapse the wave function. And those wave packets head back together and they eventually overlap in this region here. A final chi over two pulse mixes the two, uh, the upper trajectory and the lower trajectory. And we ask the question, do we see interference? So here's some early data. This has been refined. But uh, basically, uh, any relative phase shift between those two interfering paths, the way we have this interfer interferometer aligned, swings the population between one output. By population, I mean all 10 to the 5 atoms between one output port and the other output port. It's doing that randomly here because we don't control the overall absolute phase. There, the phase is determined by uh, the shaking of a, it turns out, the shaking of, a, of, 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 of that lower mirror, which is basically uh, uh, changing the phase of the optical field that's being read into the atomic coherence. And because even though we're in a vibrationally quiet place, it's not that quiet. And uh, uh, after 50 of these pulses where the mirror is shaking up and down in an uncontrollable way, uh, the, the overall phase of the atomic coherence is, is, is randomized. So our data, when we, we look at this, sometimes we see the atoms come out in one port, sometimes they are in the other port, sometimes they're in between. It's all over the map. And I'm just showing you pre-selected, uh, uh, or sorry, post-selected shots where the atoms are either in, in, in one port or the other port. And then when I say the phase shift uh, is either zero or five, that's my inference of, on very virtue of having uh, uh, made the link between the, the fact that I see that I'm seeing interference uh, and, and these oscillations of population. And so this is in our calibration mode where there's just two photon recoils worth of momentum recoil, where the weight packs are separated by a centimeter. And then when we stack together the long pulse sequence and go to the 54 centimeters, uh, the contrast and the signals are lower because none of those pulses are perfect, and I see uh, uh, less perfect contrast, but still large swings in momentum one out before the other. Now, if you're a skeptic at this point, you should be holding up the yellow card or the red card and saying, hang on. I, I've been into a laboratory, and if you're telling me that just by seeing fluctuations in population in the port, you're saying that you have for sure uh, identified a, a, a superposition and, and interference mechanism between these two wave packets, I got, I got news for you. I say, you know, there's lots of reasons why something can fluctuate. Like, for example, what if the intensity of the laser beam fluctuates, and uh, the intensity of your gratings uh, fluctuate, and you think you're doing one pulse sequence, but you're actually doing something completely different? Uh, what if you're missing some of those velocity classes? This is a complicated sequence. There's hundreds of pulses. You miss one of those pulses, you're not going to see interference. Maybe they're actually conspiring to give you some coherent effect where you just have random noise here. How can you be sure this is evidence for uh, interference? Good question. So uh, confronted with this, we, this is what we, we, we think is the, you know, kind of puts us in the territory of you, you, you really can't doubt that there's uh, interference. And that is, uh, we can go and do what you do in an optical interferometer. We can, we can change the 
alignment of the, 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 um, the mirrors and beams alert, if you will, to go to a situation where we think we should have interference to one where we think we shouldn't have interference. So uh, what's that uh, in this apparatus? Well, first, what, physically, thinking physically, what is it to have interference and not have interference? You, we have these pairs of wave packs that are flying together again. And uh, if they're overlapped within the coherence length of the source, I would expect to see interference. If I change their overlap, if I change the timing sequence of the pulses so that they don't overlap, then I would expect not to see interference. And uh, because this is a very straightforward thing to calculate when I should and when I shouldn't see interference in terms of the amount of overlap, uh, uh, I, can, I can kind of map out when I see interference and when I don't see interference. My, my metric for interference is do I see fluctuations at the output port of the interferometer? As, and, and, and to see if the, the fluctuations parametrically depend on the, the shape of the, the interferometer whether the wave pack is overlapped at the end. And so this horizontal axis <coughs> is basically a measure of do the wave packets overlap at the end. And the vertical axis is the, the, the variance in the fluctuation between one port and the other port. And uh, you can see that uh, as we change that timing offset, you go from a situation of like essentially no interference. Uh, no interference. When, I, when you have point one there, there's always noise uh, in, in, in measuring the, 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 the two output ports. So uh, that's, that, this, is, this is technical noise. And basically, I, I say, if, if the interference is going to give me a fluctuation that's less than 0.1 on this, on this metric, then I can't tell you I have interference. But you can see, uh, as you go and you tune within the coherence length, uh, this is at 54 centimeters, you see the interference come up and then, and then go away. Uh, and there's a certain width to that distribution in terms of timing offsets. Uh, for the 36 centimeter wave packet separation, which I achieved by a different timing sequence, less pulses in that sequence, I get more contrast, bigger fluctuations. Well, that makes sense because I don't have as much technical noise. And the, the width actually uh, of that contrast sample goes up. And for 18 centimeter, I get even better contrast and even larger width. Well, that width is directly calculable in terms of the momentum spread of the source, which we can independently measure. That sets the coherence length. Uh, of, of the interferometer. And so a uh, simple theory can tell us what that width should be and, and what we uh, observe. And so that's this inset here. This is the uh, separation of the wave packets. And this is the coherence, the time, the, the width of the wave packets, uh, the width of these contrast envelopes. And you can see our observations map onto this very simple theory that is, whose origin is I have quantum inference between these, uh, these uh, separate wave packets. Uh, the fact that you see that says that you have to be seeing interference. Yeah? If you shear the phase across the cloud by tilting your mirror, yeah. doesn't, that, doesn't that also prove like in a single shot that you have interference? Right. Okay. Yeah, and so in, in our paper we, we, did, we did some phase shear. Uh, and this, uh, at the time, our signal noise was not tuned up enough to, to have reliable phase shear images at the largest wave packet okay. separation. Okay. So that's why we, we didn't present the data. Okay. But now most of the data we take is all in this phase shear mode. Yeah. Uh, okay, so that was my exhaustive experimentalist uh, overview. I want to shift gears and talk about this uh, I start now in terms of what you can learn about the physical world. So, what do you learn when you see wave packets separated by a half meter come back together and overlap? Well, uh, operationally, let's think just very top level before we dress this up with quantum gravity and all sorts of you know you know other stuff. If each of those atoms in the ensemble gets a spurious momentum kick that differs atom to atom across the ensemble, like the kind of uh, momentum kicks I was talking about from technical details uh, about a half hour ago, then that will ruin the interference contrast. Because the, the, each, each and every wave packet uh, will not come back in phase. Some will be in phase, some will be out of phase. When I average over the distribution, I will get no contrast. So uh, 
what we want to think about is, are there mechanisms out there that can give minuscule uh, momentum recoil to an atomic weight pack? Now, I say minuscule. How do I calculate what minuscule is? Well, uh, basically, if I think about the propagation phase of the wave packet, uh, I go over a distance of L. If I have some momentum, this is the momentum recoil. Uh, due to some spurious mechanism that we don't we don't understand, if if that times L is on the order of one radian, and it, it's it's different from each and every atom in the ensemble, then this this implies uh, no contrast. What this says is, if I want to make a very sensitive measurement, searching for spurious momentum recoil. I win when I make L big. Because it's not going to take a lot of momentum so that delta K times L is on the order of radian. So uh, that's the essential idea behind many of these, these, these tests. And then you've got to go and say, well, what could the thing be that gives you a spurious delta K? Maybe there's some structure to space time, for example, that we don't anticipate. We, when we do quantum mechanics, non-relativistic Schroeder equations, space and time are uniform manifolds, right? They're just, it's, you know, you've got given uh, uh, um, a structure that is not fluctuating, uh, is, is something where the rulers exist, and we can go and assume that we can meaningfully talk about an L that's, that's regular and, and so forth. But maybe it's not that way. Maybe things are shaky. Maybe there's, there's uh, some of the early theories, the so-called Ellis model. Maybe there are little wormholes flying through, little wormholes flying through, giving it space-time this characteristic of fluctuation. In which case, those fluctuations give rise to these small phase shifts, which then, if inhomogeneous in this experiment, would, would wipe out the interference. So what's some model? That, there's been a, a kind of a, a number of models that have been entering the literature after this experiment. One of them that, that I like is the so-called KTM model. And this is uh, work out of uh, I did have the perimeter and other places where bounds on this model uh, are, are, are obtained by uh, the, the inference that we see uh, uh, coherence in that, in that experiment. The, the idea being, uh, if KTM model were true, then I wouldn't be able to see uh, interference. And the, the, the essence of the KTM model it has something to do with the fact that the gravitational force experienced at this location is different from the gravitational force experienced at that location, and we, we don't have a, a crisp understanding of how to think about gravity. Um, and the, the, the dephasing rate for the KTM model is proportional, it turns out, to the separation of the wave pack squared and a bunch of constants. This is just, I mean, do I believe in this model? I don't know. I'm just an experimentalist. I'm a stupid experimentalist. I just go out and observe the interference and then. It's, you know, then people who have, are building models of uh, space and time and gravity should tell, tell us whether or not you know, you, their model will support uh, interference. So uh, this, this paper basically rules out that KTM model. Lots of other models out there. I don't want to go and catalog them all for you. I think the overall feeling is that some of these are, that the plate board is very speculative. <laughs> and, uh, you know, probably not likely to be true is another way of saying it. Uh, and so we are, uh, you know, we would love to come up with uh, something to test that, you know, people really thought uh, had some meat. Uh, let's talk it a little bit more refined. So far, I, I'm talking interferometry. When you build an interferometer, you usually build an interferometer to measure phase shifts. I haven't even talked about phase shifts that much detail yet. How do I think about the phase shifts for these interferometers? Well, uh, lots of different ways of calculating the relative phase between the rolling wavelength of one, the rolling uh, waves of one pack versus the other pack. For example, you might just dust off the Schrodinger equation and solve the Schrodinger equation. Perfectly legitimate thing to do. Uh, a lot of times we use the finite path integral approach just because it gives a, a conceptually uh, uh, a nice way of thinking about this. And when you use finite path integrals, for these uh, situations, you have to calculate propagation phase shifts. This is the number of wavelengths of one set of the rolling waves on an upper path with respect to the lower path. This is a space-time diagram, time axis, space axis. Uh, you also have to uh, 
accommodate the fact that when the light fields are pulsed on, it beats the phase of the laser into the atomic coherence. Uh, this is what was ultimately responsible for the phase noise in our measurement. And the fact that the wave packets may not overlap when they, uh, uh, after, after they separate uh, and combine. And this is well known. The story of Kona Tanuji had a, just an awesome paper back in 2006, which if, if you want, you know, kind of a, a great pedagogical introduction to this, uh, uh, I would, I, 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 sorry, 1994, uh, the Journal of Physique. Uh, this, this is just an awesome paper that explains how to make these calculations. Uh, this paper by Bombs uh, uh, specializes this to light pulse and Uh You do those shifts, you get these, you do, you know, using um, um, your favorite algebra package, and uh, you get these lists of possible phase shifts. <clears throat> depending on how you parameterize the Hamiltonian for the wave packets. And uh, I want to show you <clears throat> what we affectionately describe as a turbulence for uh, a simple set of interactions. We're assuming here that the atoms are flying through an environment that has acceleration due to gravity, gravity gradients, and rotations. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> parameters. So uh, g is the acceleration due to gravity, omega is the rotation of the Earth, v is the velocity of the, uh, the source. Let's look at a couple of these terms. This one here, k effective, k effective is the effective momentum recoil associated with the train of pulses. That times g times t squared is huge. It's almost 10 to the 10 radians for 54 centimeters. If your objective is to measure g, this strikes me as a, a great way of measuring g if you can control phase. Because large phase shift means that G doesn't have to change by much to see uh, a measurable effect. Now remember, if phase shifts by pi, all those atoms, all 10 to the 5 atoms, swing from one output port up to the other port, output port. So if the acceleration due to gravity were to change by a part of 10 to the 10, basically all the, all the, all the atoms swing from one output port to the next. Uh, I want to focus on this one here. And this will be the last thing that uh, I tell you about. So, look at this term here. Most, it's interesting that most of these do not depend on, I'm building an interferometer with the Broly waves. And look, all those phase shifts do not depend on Planck's constant. Well, that's an interesting question. Why don't they depend on Planck's constant? So, we'll come back, we can come back to that. Look at this one here. This, this here depends on Planck's constant, depends on the mass of the atom. You usually see those two together, and it depends on the gravity gradient. This is a well-known shift that's been in the literature for de Broglie wave interferometry since the mid-80s. And it's, it's important because it's the first shift that <coughs> really uh, explicitly depends on uh, you know, something quantum, Planck's constant, and also something uh, fundamentally gravitational, the curvature of space-time. This looks like it depends on gravity, but if you're a believer in the equivalence principle, we all know that we can go to a falling frame and what we were calling gravity can be replaced by a kinematic idea, namely the acceleration of that reference frame. And so uh, there's a theoretical literature building since the 80s that says, like, you really shouldn't think you're testing too much about gravity when you're just measuring g. If you want to test gravitation, you're, making, you're testing a statement about curvature of the gravitational field. And so look for terms that depend on gravity gradients. So this term is actually now big in our apparatus because of this large wave packet separation. Every other experiment, I've been hunting down this term for a while in my career, and every other apparatus we built, this term was frustratingly small. You have to have the wave packet, the wave function of the atom, separated out over a substantial distance in order for it to, to, to start to feel the curvature of the gravitational field of the Earth. So uh, we built the following. Uh, um, Apparatus. Uh, sorry, engineered the following sequence of pulses to try and observe and isolate that shift. What we did was we. This is a space-time diagram, time axis, space axis, and uh, let's go and give. I'm plotting the center of mass of wave packets here. Let's give momentum recoil to the wave packets to open up and close two loops simultaneously. This loop and this loop. And the idea is each one of these loops. 
senses a different gravity gradient. Uh, uh, this is separated by 12 centimeters, and so the, the force due to gravity on, on this arm is different from the force due to the gravity on that arm because of a gravitational gradient. And then this loop here also has that same situation. We're going to design an apparatus such that the gravitational gradient in this area is different from the gravitational gradient in that area. And then we're going to compare the phase shifts from this loop to that loop by steering the wave packets back together and taking a picture. And now we're using a, a phase shear readout mode where we misalign the angle of the two exit beams so that uh, we get uh, kind of fringes across the, the, uh, the interfering wave packets. OK, so that's the experiment uh, idea. Here's the configuration. The curvature is going to be due to a stack of lead bricks that we bring close to the top of the tower. Uh, and what's happening is these, these wave packets are flying up in two interferometer loops. They're separating by 12 centimeters. And uh, the lead bricks are sitting right here. The gravity gradient from the lead bricks is going to be different at this location from that location, depending on where I launch these, uh, these interferometers. And I'm going to measure the gravity gradient from those bricks uh, by their quantum phase shift. This is a space-time diagram showing where the wave packet trajectories are, and this is the, uh, the sort of uh, gravity gradient uh, associated with the, the bricks. And because these two interferometers sense the accelerations of these locations differently, we get phase shifts that we can measure and then quantify. So these are the observed phase shifts when I change the position of the bricks between being close to the, the wave packets and being far away. Basically. Curvature of the when the bricks are in, I see the curvature from the bricks. When the bricks are away, I don't see their curvature. Uh, in a measurable way from the uh, interference patterns. And I can predict what, with just standard quantum mechanics, what I expect that, uh, that phase shift to be between the, the upper interferometer and the lower interferometer as a function of where these wave packets are, and uh, you know, measure them and plot them, and that's what we see. Uh, what's really totally uh, fascinating to me about this is that uh, I can't understand the observed phase shift unless I, I explicitly uh, uh, build into my analysis that the, the, the wave function for the atom is at, is at quote, two places at once, that it simultaneously is going on the upper arm and the lower arm and then interfering. And what's, what's interesting about that in this situation is that the upper arm experiences one gravitational force. The lower arm expresses, experiences a different gravitational force. I, I had a, a, an F-35 uh, test pilot in, in my uh, Joyce Ray Force Fighter. He was coming in, joining the lab. Uh, really smart guy. He came in and he said, well, gee, I, I here you're talking about interference in quantum mechanics. And boy, when I took my quantum mechanics, it's been a while. I mean, this is a guy who's a test pilot, so he's doing this barrel rolls. This has been a while. But I can remember somebody telling me if there was something that could observe the wave packet, then the interference would go away. And I'm like, that's correct, sir. It's like, well, isn't the force of gravity different at those two locations? Why, why doesn't that? observe the wave pack. Why doesn't it collapse the wave pack? All right, so we all have, we, we could all have our own. I, I said something, the hand waving, and I was like, well, you see, you don't really understand, you know, it's a classical field, whatever. But if you think about some of the theories that people are writing down to test, that, that is some essential physics, that, that physical question we're asking about gravity. Is there something in the gravitational field that somehow, when gravity, when the force is different in one location in space from the other location in space, collapses the wave pack. Um, and so when I have a phase shift that, ignoring that high level idea, depends on one wave packet seeing one force and another wave packet seeing another force, uh, and basically only when those wave packets uh, you know, come together and interfere do I observe a phase shift, but I know that the force of the gravity were resolvably different in that. I, I'm starting to think that I'm, I'm testing, I'm learning something about gravity that I hadn't been able to learn before, I only assumed. Uh, and so uh, that was the output of, of this, this, in my view, the physics output of this uh, was something that has been proposed since the, uh, the, the 80s and the, and the 90s about 
find a situation where you can make a wave packet spatially extended by enough distance that it senses curvature. Because what's happening there is this quantum system, I don't care if it's an atomic wave packet or a neutron wave packet or an electron wave packet, this quantum wave packet has now sensed gravity in a quantum mechanical wave. And that sensing has been done by bringing them back together and allowing them to interfere. So, uh, you know, some people think it's just dancing on the head of a pin, because of course gravity, uh, being a, represented by a classical field, should never uh, lead to a situation where it would dephase that. Uh, that. On the other hand, uh, ruin interference, I should say. On the other hand, uh, we have never had gravity in this regime before. We have never had wave packets be big enough to sense gravitational curvature directly. And so, as experimentalists, you know, let's knock on the, you know, Ring the bell and see what, what, what frequency we get. That's what we're doing here. Uh, I've been going for an hour, and I think this is uh, probably a great place to stop. And be, I'd be happy to uh, take questions now or over the course of the day. Thanks for listening. So um, gravity is the first derivative of the potential, and then uh, the gravitational gradient is the second derivative of the potential, okay. or the, the gradient of the acceleration. Okay. Yeah. And TCC is right. If you wanted to dress that up, um, you know, with fancy GR language, is just directly proportional to a, a component of the Riemann curvature. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, yeah. so is there any distinction to be made by between space-time curvature and gravity gradient? Um, how do you mean? So like, there have been papers previously on using atom interferometers to measure gravity gradients. Mm -hmm. right? So in in this case, like at least to me, it just looks like a gravity gradiometer, right. where you start with the same source. Yeah. Uh, so is there some is there some subtle difference between oh. a gravity <laughs> gradient? Yeah, so I, I, let, me, let me go back and uh, point out the key difference between previous gravity gradient work and this. So, uh, what's crucial is that each one of these interferometer loops itself, or maybe I go back to this term list, yeah, backwards. This term here, in a single loop, senses gravity gradient. All previous gravity gradient or gradiometers have had two sources and essentially run. They, they basically measure acceleration in this region and acceleration in this region and subtract it, right? And there's nothing coherent about that measurement between this location and that location. Two completely different sources. This, this looks like that, but the, the physics is, is, is different now. This, this loop up here is not measuring the uniform acceleration due to gravity. It's measuring the difference in acceleration between this arm and that arm. So, what we, what we designed this apparatus to do is to basically sense the uh, difference in gradient between this region, that you see this is the acceleration uh, due to gravity from the brick. This upper interferometer loop senses one gravity gradient, one TCC. This lower loop senses a different TCC. And then this term HK squared over M times T -T TCC is a term that we're isolating. And, uh, I skipped this and I perhaps shouldn't have. How do, you, how do you isolate it? Well, it's crucial to look at the scaling of that term as a function of the separation of the wave packets. Uh, in a previous, if, 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 if I didn't have this term that was h bar k squared over m t z z, I, I wouldn't see this, uh, the dependence I see. I would see something different. So that's, that's how we, we isolate that. So uh, completely different from the way earlier gradient work. But this also is a great conventional gradient. <laughs> Just a bigger one. This, well, um, you know, some of the some of the, the, the gradients that we're thinking about, we want to have the separation between clouds of atoms be big, oh, bigger in wave pack separation. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, um, I guess to clarify, um, so uh, how I guess the system like, works mechanically in a sense is like you kind of do two different lattice launches with two different like atom 
French Brothers in a sense. And then, so like when it launches, <coughs> like is it the first part of which you know, like that loudest launch, or is it like you know, a separate set of themes? I put that slide out. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad I got experimental questions. So a lot of time to experiment. Yeah, we have a set of lattice beams that come in there before the interferometry beams ever touch the atoms. And, and those are designed just to make this, this moving, moving lattice. Right. Two different laser system, all the rest. And then uh, after that, after the lattice launch is over, then we come in with the other beams. Okay. Right? And now you might ask, uh, well, why do you use two different sets of beams? Because <coughs> Um, it might be that we could do both functions at once. Uh, like, why not do 2,000 repos worth of momentum with a bunch of Bragg transitions, for example, or a more refined atom optic sequence? And the reason we couldn't do that uh, at the time was that we didn't have power enough laser. Just our laser wasn't, the system wasn't good enough. We're upgrading the laser now where I think we'll be able to do both functions with the same set of beams. But it requires like a 20 watt laser, and it's been years in the making. And so, um, do you have to worry about issues with, um, so, because you kind of have, you know, two different sets of, you know, two atom emission parameters where you have like a high arc and a low mm -hmm. arc, do you have to worry about any kind of interaction between the two before they get up there? Like, is that something you have to consider, or yeah. are they like spatially apart enough, or they have to have different enough times that they... Yeah, I love the question. So, um, you, one of the, there, there are points in time where the atoms, from one interferometer are in the same region of space as the atoms and the other interferometer. It's early on, the same region, you know, being uh, kind of relatively close to the, the launch point. You can ask the question, you know, do atom atom collisions give you spray spaceships? And, <clears throat> you know, fortunately, the theoretical framework for understanding that S wave collisions in cold atoms is understood from the clock community. And so we can bound the, the possibility of that giving us a phase shift. And it's, for our parameters, the densities are so low. The, the likelihood of collisions are so rare that we don't see an observable phase shift in that situation. But that is something that you definitely, uh, I mean, we thought a lot about that and engineered the apparatus, so we're not uh, in that regime. One of the reasons we do this delta kick, what we call for atom lensing sequence, is to relax the density to be, be very, the atoms are very dilute, so we don't have to worry about precisely that effect. Okay. So, uh, I have a dumb question. Like, why? Those two kinds of separate get that because right now on top of my head I only know the red resonate for the parameter. Like if we go that in a free volume, uh, free volume accordingly, and one yeah. like pass is at rest, then the other pass gain K then right. back. Good. So is the picture draw if I draw that in free volume coordinate system, does that look like one pass? Yeah, well, so, um, yeah, here's stuff I, you know, because of the time I didn't, I didn't get to, uh, but it's, it's, I put all my notes online, and uh, I won't talk about this tonight, so uh, you, know, I, you can build on it by, by reading the notes and the papers. If I go into a, a appropriately co-moving frame, uh, then I, I can actually think of the, 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 the interferometers as being these symmetric diamonds. Uh, so, so it's, it's, Pick your reference frame uh, to, to do the analysis. Okay. I have one more question. Why the number of those kicks is always even, like two H bar, eight bar, H bar? Oh yeah, but that's right. Uh, that's because the uh, in the Bragg transition regime we're working. Um, we we uh, yeah, this is uh, this is a good question. So. Um, Let's take a look at the, the atomic structure of Brigadium 87. You have the ground state hyperfine levels, and you have the 7 to 8 nanometer uh, tra allowed transition. And the Bragg transitions basically ab absorb a photon from uh, the ground. We prepare them in the F equal 3, M equal 0 state. They absorb a photon, and then uh, they are stimulated and emitted back down to the ground state. And so, uh, and I left out this slide, I probably shouldn't have done this, uh, left that one out. The, uh, the, the transitions take you from um, the uh, F uh, equal 3, M equals 0 state with momentum equal 0, and they go to the F equal 3, M equals 0 state with momentum equal 2 h bar k, 
and uh, that's because I absorb a photon and I stimulate a beta photon from the opposite direction. Uh, I can't have the 1H1K version. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Do you need to worry about the exciting atom? And then, and then you're, you're yeah, we do. Yeah, and what's, what's kind of cool about it, this has been a systematic, so spontaneous emission, bad actor for all of uh, uh, these light waves and others has been something that we've been engineering around for decades. Uh, because if, if you spontaneously emit, that can happen here. Uh, this is at some detuning delta. Spontaneous emission process doesn't. It's, it's, it's uh, the probability depends on one over the detuning squared for the transition. So those, those events will happen, and then that's a random momentum kick. And that that atom is gone. So uh, we work with very large momentum, uh, I'm sorry, uh, very large detunings from the uh, uh, the optical transition by, by our standards, like uh, 30 gigahertz. And what that does is uh, the, the, the Bragg transition routing frequency uh, basically scales as one over detuning, and the spontaneous emission rate, the loss rate, scales as one of our detuning squared. So by choosing larger detunings, uh, I can uh, basically have coherent uh, rate be much larger than the spontaneous emission rate. Uh, if spontaneous emission happens, that, that, that atom is, is, is lost from the interferometer. The kind of cool thing about this, this is the scale that we're doing the experiment on is, uh, if an atom gets a two-photon recoil momentum kick, that's like a bomb going off. It, it's that the two-photon recoil is a centimeter per second after three centimeters after three seconds the full flight time. That atom is three centimeters away from where it should have been, and we just don't even it doesn't even fit in our window for taking a picture. So uh, spontaneous we filter out and we only look at the atoms essentially don't get spontaneous emission. I don't know. Does that answer your question? Obviously, you're not going to reconfigure your whole system, but is there is it possible there's or any other methods for separating your wave packets that you would have considered? Or? Yeah, I, I, it's, it's, it's not impossible. It's probably very likely. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, there are other mechanisms involving pulses of light that my, my, my you know, people around the world are exploring. Why, you don't have to use two photon bright transitions in alpha light. You can use one photon transition in optical clock atoms. That's, I think, a very exciting prospect. Strontium uh, type uh, 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 interrogation looks good. And then you can go back to uh, the beginning of time and say, can I build a stern gerlach type apparatus, force gradients? And, and now with our refinement knowledge of how to engineer forces, could we do a much better job than was previously thought? Uh, so I think people are working on, on those kind of concepts also. The, uh, you know, light pulse is it's working pretty well. I hope there's something better. <laughs> but, yeah. Great. There have been uh, any questions? I think we should, uh, I know I'd like to encourage you to actually come up. We'll take a five minute break, and this is to be a time that you can talk to, to Mark. Thank you very much, Mark. Yeah.